we will start with Professor Muayyad Azam, who is consultant and professor at the uh, oncology gynecology at Oxford, United Kingdom. Muayyad, he has been in Jordan many times, and we thank him for giving this lecture. He participated in the Royal College course uh, 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 congresses before. So Muayyad is going to talk about surgical management of early cervical cancer. Please, Dr. Muayyad, the floor is yours. Islam, Dr. Mazen, and uh, before I start talking, I'd like to thank you um, personally and the organizing uh, committee um, for inviting uh, me. It is a, a real, real pleasure and honor to be um, among this uh, group. Um, um, I can see um, a number of uh, my bosses, Dr. Fahim, one of them, Prof. Fahim, one of them, uh, so, and a lot of uh, dear colleagues and friends. Um, uh, what I would like to um, do today is talk to you about the surgical management of uh, cervical uh, carcinoma. Um, and this is a um, combination of a bit of uh, some basic um, information as well as um, some up to date because a lot has happened um, in the, uh, to the management of cervical cancer over the last uh, few years. Um, that's not moving, yeah. So what we are going to talk about uh, today, what we are going to cover um, is the um, cancer basics, epidemiology. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the um, staging. Um, I'll touch base on the um, radiotherapy, the rationale for radiotherapy versus surgery, where the evidence is coming uh, from, and how do we make the uh, best uh, decisions and I will also um, touch base on what is happening regarding the management of uh, low risk uh, cancers, um, because um, it looks like we are, uh, as the time goes by, moving away from the more radical surgery to the more uh, conservative type of a treatment. Um, update you um, so for those who are sitting the exam on the types of radical hysterectomy, the new uh, classification. And then the elephant in the room, which has been the talk, dominated the talk like uh, the COVID um, in the uh, cancer uh, world, um, especially with the cervix, is minimal access versus um, open radical um, hysterectomy. Um, what I am not going to talk about is how to do the surgical techniques. Um, these techniques are available in multiple resources. We have one of them and we provide it um, for those who are interested. I'm not going also to talk about the radiotherapy. It's not the scope of this talk, um, nor I'm going to talk in details about the fertility um, sparing um, treatment. Um, although I'm going to cover a little bit um, in that as this is part of the management um, options. Um, and also, um, as the title um, suggests, uh, this is more of a um, um, uh, talk regarding the um, early cervical cancer as opposed to um, uh, advanced or metastatic um, cervical cancer. So, um, Starting with the basic um, information, um, we have uh, to know it's, it's a well known to everyone. Um, cervical cancer is fairly common. It is more common in the developing world. Um, there are about half a million ladies who are diagnosed with the cancer every um, year. Um, there are risk factors um, associated, um, and these uh, risk factors um, are um, related to um, in early intercourse, um, number of sexual partners, um, whether the um, person is smoking or not, um, socioeconomic loss, um, other sexually transmitted diseases, and also um, human papilloma um, virus, as we all know. Um, the histology is uh, predominantly either squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma or combination of them. There are less um, common types of uh, cancer. 
um, that less than 1% of, um, of the disease. Why it is important to diagnose um, cervical cancer and manage it at the early stage and why that justifies why the screening programs is basically um, we're talking about um, survivor rates in uh, younger uh, women. The earlier um, we detect the uh, cancer, um, the higher the survival um, rate. So the survival rate is um, um, uh, range from um, stage 1A, 90 to 100%. And when it gets down to stage 4, then it is a pretty dismal um, picture. And you are talking about 5 to 10% survival rates. In 2018, um, there was, um, and in particularly in particular in October, um, the FIGO um, published um, the updated cervical uh, cancer um, staging. And this um, staging um, is quite different in a way from the um, previous um, cervical cancer staging um, 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 prior to this date. Um, the main part of the uh, new FIGO classification um, is um, related to the uh, incorporation of um, radiological, preoperative radiological assessment um, into the cervical cancer staging. So we are now looking at the lymph nodes, whether they are pelvic or paraortic, and these lymph nodes, if um, visible and proven on the MRI scan, then we are talking about um, C1, 3C1, and 3C2 um, disease. We no longer um, talk about the horizontal dimension of the cervical cancer as part of the staging. If you read the old, um, it used to be visible, non-visible, and then you go to the depth. Now we are uh, looking at the cancer from uh, with the biopsies into the depth um, with the cutting um, three millimeter um, below and above and then five millimeter. So these are quite important uh, changes and they have their impact on the way how we look at the disease. The other part of the um, new classification um, is um, stage 1b. Um, has been, you know, in each, uh, prior to this date was broken into two, um, 1B1 and 1B2. With the new um, staging, it's been broken into three um, sub-stages, um, 1B1, 1B2, and 1B3. Um, the B1s are below two centimeters, anything between two and four um, is B2 now. So please do not get confused with the old classification when you read the literature. And the old B2 now um, is called B3 um, disease. Um, this FIGO classification um, has been um, validated um, in a number of uh, publications. And as you can see, one of them um, is uh, uh, cited here. So there is a lot of a difference between um, the 1B1 and the 1B2 in terms of survival, and we will touch base on, um, on that. Um, the, one of the troubles that we had um, with the new FIGO classification um, is the survival and the um, recording or coding survival to our patients. Um, simply because the, the concept behind the, um, uh, the, behind the survival is, is, is or the staging base that the higher the, um, the stage, the lower the survival rate is. Um, however, this is not exactly the case when you are talking about um, um, cervical cancer staging because you can have stage 3C1 uh, disease better than with, you know, with a survival rate better than stage 3B. And then within that also um, 3C1, um, there is a debate about the size of the tumor and how the metastasis. I'm not going to go into this because we need to focus on your needs um, for the um, exams. Um, just to make this story a little bit clearer um, in terms of how um, we find it a little bit more difficult 
when we are talking to the patients. Um, imagine a couple of um, patients here. So they are both stage three, one, three C1. So patient A has just a small cancer, um, less than a centimeter. She has negative lymphovascular invasion. And then um, on the MRI scan and the imaging that we've done, um, she had a positive lymph node. Surely this is not a, has, this patient does not have the um, same um, risk for recurrence and mortality uh, for a patient who has a five centimeter or six centimeter with invasion with um, parametrial the uh, pelvis. So, um, and the same apply for um, stage um, for disease. Um, having a, just a lymph node outside the, the field may not necessarily um, represent um, um, the same significant impact on the survival and mortality. The changes, the impacts of, of of in addition to this, of this in new FIGO classification into our um, practice, um, not all of it is negative, but there are also some positive uh, aspects. We now um, can talk to our patients a little bit more um, and with a bit more of emphasis on the tumor uh, cancer and size. Um, to ensure that we offer them the uh, better treatment. This is particularly for the 1B because prior to this 1B1, the old 1B1, which is encompassed less than two centimeter and between two centimeter and four centimeter, these two groups of patients actually, they have a different behavior and a different risk. So categorizing the lower risk patient is always um, useful. From radiation point of view or clinical oncology um, point of view, it helps them to um, by assess the size and assess the risk and then define on what type of uh, treatment they need to do. Um, we said um, about the preoperative assessment MRI scan or um, what they call it, um, highly skilled uh, ultrasound uh, scan uh, staging. If there are any suspicious uh, lymph nodes, then now there is um, the uh, more involvement of the more advanced um, radiological assessment like PET-CT scan in the preoperative um, assessment and um, trying to give the patient what would be the best single modality of uh, treatment. The headache is still on for the um, pathologist um, because uh, um, one of the main problems um, that the pathologist would have if we, um, and that's a, a topic that comes all the time in our multidisciplinary uh, meeting discussions is um, the management of multifocal stage, what appears to be stage 1A disease how do we manage this? Um, are, is there any disease in going into the vagina or is it only localized to the cervix? So um, just to give you an update now, even when we do a loop excision or DLE or a cone biopsy of the cervix and we have positive margins, now we started calling these patients, um, um, give them a stage 1B, one at least pending um, their surgical treatment because these they do have a different behavior from the patients who have a um, single focus um, of the disease. Um, to aid the management and just to simplify it, um, as I said, um, it's, it's quite important for early cervical cancer to think about the following levels. Um, do we have stage 1A1, which is less than three millimeter uh, depth? Um, how is the lymphovascular involvement? Uh, is it positive or negative? If the lymphovascular involvement is negative, then that implies the um, risk of a lymph node metastasis is, is well below the 1%. Uh, 
Um, therefore, um, and the parametrial involvement is negligible. It's closer to zero than it is to anything else. Um, these patients are um, triaged into, the, um, into two pathways into, uh, of the management, depending on really what they want from a fertility point of view. Fertility completed, um, then simple hysterectomy without any lymphadenectomy. Um, fertility not completed, or they do not want to um, undergo the hysterectomy, then a, some form of cone biopsy, whether it is a loop um, excision or whether it is a knife cone biopsy is deemed adequate um, in the management of these patients. Um, the same group of patients, if they have the lymphovascular space invasion, or if they have a tumor more than three uh, millimeter um, deep, then that starts to put them into a slightly higher risk group. Here, we have a risk of lymph node metastasis ranges. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a range, but it can go up to 8% um, depending on which paper you are reading. The parametria um, is rarely involved in these microscopic um, diseases. And therefore, um, the management options, again, can be triaged um, depending on um, the fertility desires of the patient or whether or not they are go, uh, would, uh, would agree to undergo the hysterectomy or not. So if they are looking into the um, preserving their fertility or their uterus, then um, the mode of treatment will be some form of um, resection of the cervix, whether it is a radical trachelectomy or um, simple trachelectomy or large knife cone biopsy. I'll come to this later on in the management of low risk, uh, lower risk uh, patients. Or um, if the fertility is not preserved, then we offer them a form of um, radical um, hysterectomy with both groups will need lymph node assessment due to the increased risk of the lymph node um, assist, uh, or lymph node involvement. If they have um, a stage one uh, B1, the new classification, which is the cancer is less than two centimeter in size, then um, they run the risk of um, about 15% of having um, lymph node involvement and their risk of the parametrial involvement could go up to um, 6%. Uh, um, we still can offer fertility preserving surgery, but that's um, radical trachelectomy now here would be um, the more uh, um, appropriate treatment if that is the case. Um, and if the um, uh, fertility is not treat, uh, is not um, required, then it is an option between offering them radical hysterectomy versus primary um, chemo radio um, therapy, and we will um, get to discuss um, the um, two options um, shortly. Um, patients who have um, a one B two, but less than four centimeter, the new one B two. Um, pretty much um, the uh, same risk of uh, involvement of the lymph nodes. Um, it is a higher um, than the uh, 1B1 for parametrial involvement. Um, and here it's really um, in the practice, how we are practicing nowadays, we debate these patients a lot before offering them um, surgery. And we, we are moving more and more to be more conservative because the, once the cancer start getting closer to four centimeters, um, we start uh, seeing more and more of the high um, intermediate risk groups who might require following the surgery do well further um, radiotherapy and chemotherapy and that um, by itself um, expose the patients to a, a more significant risk of uh, morbidities and uh, complications post treatment. Um, so um, Touching base on um, what do we offer the patients. So uh, as you noticed, um, the 1B type of a cancer um, are the ones that you can either um, offer them um, radiotherapy or treat them with uh, surgery. Um, 
there is no benefit um, of one treatment over the other. It's a matter really of balancing the risks and benefits of each uh, treatment. The landmark um, study um, in this field um, goes back to 1997, published by um, Landoni, and they did not find any um, difference in the um, survival and the outcomes. Of course, um, Landoni um, paper um, is an old uh, paper. There was no chemotherapy with the radiotherapy at that time. It's about three years old. Um, no modulated uh, radiotherapy. However, um, it is still um, standing up to uh, today. Um, there was a subsequent review and update, um, and uh, the um, Cochrane group um, looked into recently in the last five years into uh, the management of um, cervical cancer at stage 1b2, all the stage 1b2, I need to keep emphasizing um, on this, and they did not find um, any uh, concrete evidence to support one way or the um, other. And therefore, um, our focus nowadays um, is primarily um, on the identification of patients who um, might benefit better from the um, surgery or might benefit better um, from the chemo radio um, therapy. There is a lot of work goes into the preoperative um, assessment. Um, one of them is the, um, this is where the imaging is, 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 is coming um, from, because if we can identify these patients who, will, um, who have a higher risk of having postoperative radiotherapy, then um, in the absence of um, superiority um, in the survival, we should be offering them um, chemo radiotherapy as a uh, primary uh, treatment. Um, so, um, where do we consider surgery? We consider surgery if the likelihood of um, postoperative um, chemo radiotherapy is low. These patients, um, we look at the images, we look at the, um, we examine them, we find, okay, um, it's unlikely that we're going to offer them chemo radiotherapy. Also, um, if we want to preserve their ovaries, although we can go um, beyond that by um, doing um, ovarian suspension pre chemo radiotherapy. Um, radiotherapy um, can, uh, the younger the patient, um, the more the impact on the um, sexual activity, especially if they have um, brachy therapy, and that can um, have a significant impact on their quality of life, especially those who are uh, respondent to the uh, treatment. And we all know um, that the radio uh, therapy will, uh, uh, the patients, um, go out for surgery if they do not have any risk of secondary malignancy. Where do we prefer radiotherapy? Well, these are the higher risk um, group, or um, these are the patients who are uh, uh, unlikely to benefit from ovarian uh, conservation, menopausal women, or uh, closer to uh, mini uh, menopause. Um, how do we identify um, the uh, patients who might benefit um, from, uh, who might need radiotherapy or um, not? Um, although um, this is a very um, open subject and uh, a lot of interpretation goes there, um, the data that we know and we use nowadays in deciding who needs or doesn't need the uh, radiotherapy is coming from the GOG 92, uh, uh, which was published in 1999, and these are the um, seedless criteria. And uh, basically, um, it is um, dependent on the lymphovascular space invasion, um, size of a tumor, and the depth of stromal um, invasion. So um, if um, they have LVSI um, positive with deep uh, stromal invasion, irrespective of the size, they are the intermediate high-risk um, group. Um, their cancer is two centimeters or more um, than involvement of the middle uh, one-third of the pelvis um, would put them into, with the um, presence of the LVSI, would put them into the higher risk group and so forth. Cancers of large size, 
uh, more than four centimeters. Um, really, irrespective of their LVSI, um, they are a higher uh, risk of um, requiring chemoradiotherapy. Hence, we are moving away from that because a number of the uh, publications for people who used to do the larger cervical cancer um, uh, surgically found that about 75 to 80 percent of um, patients would end by having um, chemo radiotherapy um, after the surgery and by this they end by having the uh, dual uh, risk of, of, of comorbidities. So um, why are the the these classifications are quite important. Well, if we have, um, if the patient classify um, into this criteria as a higher risk, we know that um, there is a 30% chance of recurrence or um, death, and therefore um, radiotherapy is quite um, indicated. If the uh, criteria is low, then the risk of recurrence is um, significantly um, lower. Um, for patients who either undergo surgery or um, chemoradiotherapy um, for uh, stage 1b cervical cancer, um, the overall survival is uh, similar as well as the um, progression or disease-free um, survival. The recurrence rates are similar between both groups. Um, the problem is if we have um, radiotherapy post-surgery, um, then the morbidity goes up almost to 30% versus um, radiotherapy alone or surgery alone, which is below um, the 15%. Uh, um, that applies to um, almost all the um, pelvic organs, um, including the um, ureter, um, fistulas and potential um, further um, complications. So um, to summarize the um, surgery versus radiotherapy for um, stage 1b and their potential uh, problems, um, the pros and cons um, for each of them. So the surgery, uh, like what we said, if, uh, has certain um, risk factors that can cause uh, bladder dysfunction, um, fistulas, um, and bowel obstruction secondary to adhesions. However, the radiation uh, treatment can end by uh, long-term uh, proctitis, sigmoiditis, further fistulas, bowel obstruction. So pretty much similar uh, level of of complications with one more acutely with the surgery and one more um, chronic. Um, the benefits of the um, surgery um, uh, go for ovarian and uh, pre preservation and preservation of the um, sexual uh, function. Moving on um, to the next part of the talk, and that is the uh, the new classification for radical um, hysterectomy. Um, up until um, 2017, 2018, we all we used to um, use the classification described by uh, Piver and um, Rutledge, which you can see it on the right hand uh, side for the different types of um, hysterectomy. Um, Dennis Kerlou, um, who was the president of uh, ESCO the, uh, recently, and uh, Moro um, studied the anatomy and they, they provided um, a three-dimensional um, classification for the um, radical um, hysterectomy. And this is what we are uh, using these days um, to describe our radical hysterectomy. This provides us um, with more um, consistency and um, comparison of like with like when it comes to um, looking at the surgical outcomes, uh, morbidities. The majority of um, um, us, if they uh, offer uh, the more advanced uh, radical surgery, we are probably the majority of them go under the 3C1 uh, um, for the uh, patients um, and as well as the um, lower risk 
group, um, either um, type A or type B uh, one. Um, touching base on the lower risk group, um, which is the 1A1 um, positive LVSI, 1A2, and the um, 1B1 uh, one, um, with the new classification. It used the, in the previous study, which uh, studies which were set up before the 2018, they were used to call them 1B1 below two centimeters. The idea um, of looking into this lower risk group um, a, a was brought um, with the question is, do we really have to offer um, radical hysterectomy for all cervical uh, patients, um, knowing the impact of the radical hysterectomy into the quality of life of these uh, patients? So Covens et al. in 2002, um, they um, published um, their work. So they had about 842 uh, patients whom they looked at um, the lymph nodes. Um, so they found that the lymph node um, rate was 6% among their cohort with 4% uh, uh, parametrial involvement. For the subgroup, um, with cancer less than two um, centimeters and the depth of invasion, they didn't have um, deep stromal invasion. So the depth was less than 10 millimeters. They actually found that the lymph node involvement was significantly uh, low and their experience was 0% and less than 1% in the parametria. Um, the, um, these outcomes were echoed by further uh, publication by Wright et al. and Fromeros um, in 2007 and 2019. So based on that understanding, now we have a number of uh, trials. Um, the most famous of them is the um, SHAPE trial, um, which I'll uh, talk about it um, in a second. Um, but also at the Andy Anderson um, carried um, um, a, a trial, um, an open label single institution trial called the um, CONSERVE, um, which they um, looked into the conservative management um, for the lower risk uh, groups. Also the um, GOG um, launched in um, um, 2012. Um, a trial looking um, into the quality of life for patients um, who and are undergoing uh, um, uh, more um, simple um, treatment. And we know the um, quality of life outcomes for the more radical um, surgery. For the um, conserve, um, the criteria, how they included the patients, um, it is the 1A. Um, 1B1 uh, one, um, uh, and uh, the term less than two centimeters because it started below two th before 2018. Um, patients should be squamous cell or adenocarcinoma. Their LBSI is negative. They, they don't have the higher risk of deep stromal invasion. Um, so the interventions that were um, compared, um, they were based on the fertility preservation, um, whether the patient wants to retain the uterus or not. If the patient's um, keen on retaining the uterus, then it was uh, a cone biopsy followed uh, with uh, pelvic lymph node dissection. If they um, um, did not want to retain the fertility, then it is a simple hysterectomy with node dissection. Um, the study was conducted before 2018, before the uh, publication of the LAC trial, um, and therefore the majority of the patients were managed with minimal uh, invasive um, surgery. So um, the trial um, finished recruitment, and they have uh, they presented their um, interim analysis at two years uh, follow-up. So they found that the lymph nodes uh, involvement is about 5% and uh, the recurrence rate was um, 3% as we said at two years um, follow-up uh, from the um, closure of the trial. The SHAPE trial, um, which I believe is one of the trials um, that worth uh, considering um, and as you 
finish your exams and uh, be a future consultant. Um, the uh, results of the trial will be mature enough and we will have uh, more, much clearer um, answers um, to the um, safety of uh, simpler uh, treatments. So um, it is a multinational, multi-institution uh, trials, um, uh, randomized control trial, um, criteria for involvement of cervical patients, specifically for the cancer, is the size is less than two centimeters, the depth is less than 10 millimeter, um, and uh, uh, stromal invasion is less than 50% uh, on MRI scan. Um, and pretty much um, because it's a low risk group, um, um, uh, the majority of, of the patients will have that. Um, the um, interventions that they um, compared, um, simple hysterectomy um, with lymph node um, dissection versus radical um, hysterectomy. And the primary outcomes, um, uh, recurrence, progression-free survival, and overall um, survival. Um, the recruitment of this study um, started in 2015. It has been completed in 2019, and we are waiting to get the results. So we are anticipating the um, results of this trial to be shared um, within the next couple of years uh, in 2023. Um, moving on to the elephant in the room, um, and this is quite, um, nothing has changed the world in, in cervical cancer um, in a, um, adopting or um, lack of adopting or, or uh, leaving an intervention like the LAC trial. It is the open um, versus the uh, minimal invasive um, surgery. The, um, the Grenade um, paper um, was published in um, one of the most reputable um, journals, the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2018. Up to that point, um, we all had the um, understanding and the belief that um, minimal access surgery and open surgery are uh, equivalent in terms of survival and recurrence uh, outcomes with the advantage of the minimal access in terms of uh, quality of life uh, improvement. So we thought that the minimal access would be the more superior uh, type of intervention. To put the findings of the LAC trial in perspective, we need to understand why it has its impact. Simply because recurrence rate could happen, um, and it, as in publication, it happens in about 10 to 20 percent of you know kind of um, all the um, cervical cancer um, who has been treated. The problem with uh, with the recurrence, if there is a recurrence, um, then the mortality is high, um, and that's where um, people got nervous when they had the uh, results of the um, LAC trial, and this is why. If you are wondering why it has such an impact on the practice more than um, other negative outcome um, trials. So when the LACA trial um, was set up, uh, and the, um, the assumption was that uh, minimal access surgery, uh, which has um, better um, quality of life, less morbidities, short hospital stay, um, reduce analgesia with equivalent uh, mortality and recurrence, um, um, recurrence um, rates. When they um, set up the trial, um, they set, up, set it up with the, um, um, for the ones who are um, eligible for um, surgical treatment, um, anyone with uh, 1A1, 1A2, or 1B1 all the style, so less than four centimeters, so that we don't forget. Um, the histological types were the usual ones, they are the dominant ones, and the tumor size, as I said to you, is less than four centimeter. Anyone with 1B2 was not included in their analysis because they did not uh, fulfill the inclusion criteria. So to the surprise of everyone, um, when um, the analysis uh, was presented, 
2018. Um, at that point of time, um, there were um, eight um, events or recurrence events in the abdominal arm, um, open arm, versus 32 events um, in the um, minimal axis surgery arm. And that was quite um, significant. Um, similar uh, impact on, you can see the two lines of survival, and these are data were available for almost 60% of the patients in 2018. Um, and um, we had more patients passed away or died in the uh, minimal axis surgery as a result of the cancer um, when compared to the open uh, technique. Um, different people at that stage um, uh, criticized the trial um, because that came contradicting the, um, the belief. So um, the same group um, of, um, who published the LAC trial, they updated their um, data. And this was from one of the um, ESCO um, presentations in 2019. And we still have disease. Um, the events in the um, recurrence are still significantly higher um, in the minimal axis when they were compared to the open surgery. And here you are talking about almost 85% um, percent of the patients being analyzed um, at, four, um, at this stage for after uh, four and a half years um, follow-up. Um, with that in mind, um, with the word is, 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 is uh, splitting, um, whether to take, believe, or um, leave um, the outcomes of the um, LAC uh, trial, um, different groups from different parts of the world, um, including the BGCS, um, ESGO, um, East and West, they looked into their um, practice and we started, we looked and analyzed. The thing is, almost now, um, and these are the analysis from the um, quoted uh, papers, pretty much everyone found that um, the uh, survival following minimal access surgery um, is um, significantly lower um, than it for the open technique. Um, ESGO was uh, initially reluctant to um, accept the outcomes um, and uh, um, championed by Luis Chiva in uh, Spain, Madrid, Spain. Um, the soccer trial um, was carried out in Europe. Um, a lot of the centers in Europe looked into the cervical uh, surgical management for stage 1B cancer. And um, it's for all the reasons confirmed the findings from the um, LAC um, trial. So um, now we have a strong evidence that the um, from prospective and retrospective studies from centers we, where we have high volumes of cancer um, surgery treatment, centers where they have the highest or the, um, the best experience in minimal access is actually did not make much of a difference in the survival. So the results of the LAC trial um, do stand up to, um, to um, our date. As a result of that, uh, the LAC trial, um, the um, uh, groups from the United States, they looked into the um, adoption um, of minimal access surgery post um, LAC trial. And this is quite interesting because I've never seen any trial, a clinical trial that has such an impact on people um, uh, practice in a short period of time. And it's quite fascinating here um, after 12 months from the publication. So zero here is the date of publication of the LAC trial, 12 months time after a year. And this is kind of the line here. Here you see um, that's the minimal access surgery, the blue line and the orange is the open surgical technique. As you can see, this starts going down, this starts going up in the United States and the curve is showing things are going significantly down now. 
And nowadays, whether you are um, in the UK, um, whether you are in the States um, and or um, in Europe, um, all the um, major um, societies, um, including um, BGCS and NICE, um, changed their recommendation and the gold standard for the surgical treatment of cervical cancer is open as opposed to um, laparoscopic, irrespective, by the way, of the size. We do not have any evidence to date um, to differentiate um, whether um, it is the surgical technique in terms of um, vaginal uh, cuff um, closure. Um, we are looking into our frozen section ourselves. We are uh, 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 planning to publish our outcomes or is it related to anything else? What we know that uh, minimal access surgery for uh, the treatment of cervical cancer, irrespective of whether it is um, below or above two centimeters, um, is, a, is a still associated with higher risk of um, recurrence and uh, mortality. So um, the take home messages um, from um, this lecture, which I hope um, to bring you, because um, this focus is, is to bring you up to date um, with your exams into the um, what is happening in the literature is the FIGO staging, the new FIGO staging. And the one of the most important changes is the um, radiological, preoperative radi radiological um, assessment. Um, the second um, take home message, which is um, quite powerful um, and uh, likely uh, you are more likely to be asked about it, is the debate over open versus radical um, hysterectomy and the fact that now open radical hysterectomy is the gold standard for the management of um, early cervical uh, carcinoma. Um, thirdly, I'd like you to remember that for smaller cancers and the lower, um, the lower risk group cervical cancers, we're probably going to be less doing less and less um, invasive or radical surgery in the future, and it might well be the simple um, tracheolectomy or cone biopsy uh, and or um, hysterectomy with lymph node, whether this is a sentinel node or uh, full lymph node dissection in the future. So the radical hysterectomy is going um, out um, fast. And the, uh, for that purpose, um, and there would be a certain percentage of the patients who might still need radical hysterectomy, um, the challenge for us now is to identify um, these patients um, who might benefit um, from either um, radical hysterectomy or um, even cho choosing to give them um, primary chemo um, radiotherapy to avoid um, dual uh, treatment.